Good morning. I will be reading Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no dis distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a pro propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness and at the present time so that he might be so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Thank you, Alex. It's great to see everyone today. It's always good to be able to worship God and just to be able to understand some of the things from His Word. And uh, it's just great to see all of your beautiful faces. Some of you because you've got a mask on, some of you because you have a mask off. So it's good to see all of you anyway. Uh, we want to talk a little bit today about what we're looking for, what's the end of all of this, as we've talked about the story through this. What happens when we get to the end of the story? What is it that we're trying to get? Uh, as we look at the Bible and look at the things, most people will say, well, I just want to go to heaven, and I don't care how I get in, I just want in. The very minimum, bottom place, bottom line, just barely squeak in the door. As if you didn't want to just walk in. Somehow I think the grace of Jesus is able to allow that where we're able to be sure that we go into heaven. But oddly enough, when you look in the Bible, it doesn't talk about people saying, I can't wait till I just barely get to heaven. You just don't see that. In fact, they don't really talk about, we're going to heaven. We're glad to go to heaven. Paul's sermons are not about, let's all get to heaven. They're about glory. And when you think about glory, isn't that expressed a lot by heaven? But maybe there's a little bit of a difference in our understanding of, you know, I want to be in a place like heaven or what does it mean to be in this glory of God? And so let's look at this a little bit today. What do we think of when we talk about glory? And the Bible describes the heavens declaring the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork, Psalm 19. It, we can see it all around us. Every single sunset or sunrise is different. Most of us see more sunsets than sunrises, but those are just as good. And we're able to see this beautiful thing that happens twice a day, and it's just staggering. And all the places around that we can see that God has made are just amazingly beautiful. Well, what do we do when we want to make glory? Well, we've gotten pretty good at it, actually. If you think of the most glorious time, what is it that you want to do for someone to have glory? It's usually fireworks, right? We're going to do something big. We're going to do something. We're going to have fireworks that celebrate a person. And if you go to a further extreme, it's not just the fireworks that you want that says, you know, this person's great, this person's wonderful, we gave them fireworks. You also build them a castle that goes along with it. And you have a parade and you have music and you call it the happiest place on earth. And it has all of this celebration. And why do people pay so much to go there? Well, wouldn't you want to be at the happiest place on earth? It's exciting. There is music. There is all of this. And this is kind of our best thing that we can do. We join the parade. We see all the lights and we do 
everything to celebrate. But let's talk a little bit today about what this means. Is heaven going to be Disney? Somehow I don't think so. And I think there's more to it than that. So the passage that Alex has read to us talks about our basic idea of salvation, what it's all about. And back in time, we recognized that a lot of it was about the fact that we were supposed to do right and not do wrong. That's been used a lot. And, and that was our basic understanding. You know, if you do right and you don't do wrong, then you go to heaven. Well, it's a little bit different than that. Uh, we're not going to do right every, ta- every time, and we are going to do wrong sometimes. Even if we do pretty good at it, we're still going to need the grace of Jesus. We're still going to need somebody who is able to take away our sin. It's never about us just deserving it and saying, I have done everything right all of my life. I think we're just fooling ourselves and we're not really fooling anyone else. We are to be the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because there's one line in this that talks about the righteousness of God and that's what we're supposed to have and that we all lost the righteousness of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what we missed. That's what we don't have is this glory of God. It's not that you fell short of heaven. It's you fell short of the glory of God. Well, why didn't he just say you don't get to go to heaven? Because that is such a tiny part of it that we wouldn't even think that that was significant. He says, you fell short of the glory of God, and that's what you were intended to have. That's where you were supposed to be. And so he talks about this concept, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ, because Christ has died on the cross for our sins. And so therefore, we are able to recognize that his sins have, or his sacrifice has paid for our sins. Let me not say that the wrong way. Uh, And that's one of the things that we are able to have. This point of salvation is that God doesn't just leave us where we are and say, okay, now your sins are forgiven, but you're just the same person you always were. That's not what he does. He takes us so much further than that into being a person of his glory into sharing his glory. And he takes us so much further into something that is maybe a little beyond our understanding. I think sometimes when people look at the outside of this, we believe in God, we love God. And so what's the goal of Christianity? Well, it's to sit in church all of your life and sing, bringing in the sheaves. And that is the best we've got to look forward to because no wonder some people don't want to go there. If that's really what they think, that's the ultimate, that's all that there is to this. And so if God is saving us, what are we saved to? Are we saved to Disney? where it's still us, but there's a whole lot of noise and excitement going on, and we get to church, and everybody's excited, and all excited, and we're excited because we're excited, 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 right? And we walk out, and we get in our car, and we go, I'm, I'm kind of empty. <laughs> I've been excited for an hour and a half now, and it didn't really give me anything. So when he talks about what we get... Where are we supposed to be? How do we share his glory? Most of the time it's about my glory and about what it is for me and about what people would give to me and how we want that kind of glory. We want the parade. We want the fireworks. We want celebrate me. And if that's what you think, then no, it doesn't work that way. When God shows his greatest glory, it looks like this. We call it Silent Night. 
It wasn't. It is the inf infinite glory of God found in a baby. Well, what's exciting about that? We've all seen them before, and they're noisy, and they're messy. And there's no parade. Jesus had fireworks, though, right? A star that shines and gets to show people exactly where he is. I mean, that's better fireworks than you could get anywhere else, but only a few people saw it. When the glory of God is seen as its greatest, there's no room at the end for the glory. And all of that glory is packed into one small baby. And wise men bring him gifts of gold. And we said, gold, all right. And glory is seen in such small ways because God's glory is always so much greater and his first intention was always that we would share his glory. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, is the passage in Hebrews 1.3. We should be able to look at this and see God's glory. When we look around us, the earth's glory fades. It doesn't keep up. We have to keep doing things to make it look better. The praise of men doesn't matter because it tends to fade. If we're looking for real glory, then a lot of times what we see is a lot of fakes. But when we do look for real glory, we find it in Jesus. We find it in God. We find it in places like that. Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, 27, or one of the most important things because he's been talking about the things that we need. What do you need? Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about all the stuff that you're going to put on, what you're going to eat and drink. And so in Matthew 6, verse 28, he says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And so he says, don't worry about clothing or food or drink or all of those things that you have to have. Now, he doesn't mean just ignore those either, make a plan, have a way, but don't become anxious about those because God supplies those. He says, what is it that we really need the most? What is it that glory really has? And he draws this comparison between lilies of the field. I don't know that we have lilies of the field in Arizona. So here's lilies of the field, lots of different colors. Lots of different things that they do. Lilies of the field are beautiful because, because they're lilies of the field. Uh, they shine, they glow, they, they bloom, but not for that long. And they're just there. They're just, but they are so intense in the color that they have and the delicacy of the flower that they have but they're just lilies, and they can't be anything else. They're, they're just lilies, and they are exactly who they were intended to be, and that's all. And the comparison is made with Solomon and his glory. There are no pictures of Solomon. Solomon. I looked. Not even Google has a picture of Solomon. This is the best we can get is some kind of a rendering of what his palace of gold might have looked like. Solomon, the greatest man, the greatest king, certainly the richest man who ever lived in any age at any time. Some of the wealth that they have, as far as estimates, there isn't a single person alive who even approaches the kind of riches that he had. 
the ability he had to be king. He's the richest man in any world. And how does he have glory? Well, let me build a house around me that has gold. Let me put on clothes that look nice. Let me make sure I get my hair cut right. Let me put on, can you wear makeup to make yourself look a little better? You know, men, we're not supposed to do that, I guess. And, you know, okay, that's your fault. We get what we get. This is where we are. But he tries to dress himself up so that he'll look good, so that he'll be there, so that everyone will see this is a man with glory because he's surrounded by it. But it's still just him. At the end of the day, it's just us. And we don't get close to lilies. Lilies are beautiful because of who they are. Solomon looks better because of the parade, because of the fireworks, because of the gold, because of all the stuff around him that gives him importance and worth and wealth. And lilies are just simple flowers in a field that just create something that is so beautiful It doesn't last long, but God says, I want you to look at this. I want you to see this. This is the lilies in the field. This is where beauty comes from, and we'll go out and we'll look at flowers. And Solomon says, look at my bank account. Here's all the metal I've got. Is it impressive? Well, sure. But Solomon's just a man. And he didn't become any better. But that's the good news of what Jesus came. He came to make us better, to give us the glory of God. And that's the comparison Jesus is trying to draw. Not that he wants us to be people that are surrounded by beautiful things. He wants us to be people that have the beautiful things of God inside. And so there's a chapter in 2 Corinthians that perhaps is one of my favorite chapters. Chapter 3, it begins with this whole concept of how do we get this? What is it that we're supposed to do? What do we look like? There's been a lot of criticism of Paul and of him being an apostle. And so this is partly his defense, but also partly trying to explain what's happened to them and what needs to happen to everyone. He says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. But you know that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And so as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Well, do I need some way for you to know who I am? Do I need a letter of recommendation? Even though that's a church he started, they would know who he was. And he says, Really, you're the letter. The fact that you're Christians, that is the letter. And so what would you write in a letter of recommendation about a Christian? What would we actually put down in a letter like that? Well, they look pretty when they come to church, right? Uh, They always wear their mask. Yeah, we're almost out of that. They serve a lot. So they lead singing, and they're really good at it. They teach a class, and they're amazing at what they do when they teach. And so we would list all the things of service that they would do. And 
Besides that, they behave themselves. They don't yell out in the middle of service and they, they, are, they are just good people. Somehow that's one of the best things we can say. They're just good people, right? And everything we listed is an accomplishment. It has nothing to do with God. So if we're really trying to write a letter of recommendation, perhaps it's not about their performance. It's not about their perfection. It's about something much more than that. It's about what God does in them. It's about the fact that their faith has survived and that they have believed in impossible times and that they stand for God and what Jesus means to them and how the love of God fills their life and about the kindness that they show to other people. And yeah, it comes out in terms of of things that they would do, but it's really trying to describe who they are and what their heart is all about. So what does the letter say? It's written on our heart. It's not found in any Bible, but it's written on our heart to say, this person is forgiven. This person has been cleansed. This person has been justified. And that they have developed the love and joy and peace of Jesus. They're not perfect, but they are reformed by the Holy Spirit. And they're able to handle anything. It's always bothered me a little bit. He says, we're sufficient. Sufficient, really? That's what he describes us as. There's no glory in being sufficient. I mean, that means just barely enough, right? Well, probably not. That means that you are sufficient for anything that's going to come against you. It's that kind of sufficient, that there isn't anything that this world could throw at us that we are not able to handle because of the power of God and that we have this confidence in God. And it's all because of Jesus. And it's because he has changed us on the inside. And it's not just a matter of us pretending to be big enough or pretending to be competent enough and really actually being scared to death of everything. It's about the fact that God has made us able to handle anything. And he draws this contrast between what happens in the law and especially with Moses and what happens in the spirit and what that spirit does. And so in verse 7, he says, Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze on Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory." Indeed, in that case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. And so what he's describing here is about Moses and about the time when he brought Israel out of Egypt, and they came to a promised land, but he calls it a ministry of death. I mean, really, that, that seems kind of bad, and he's trying to say that that's just the comparison of what it's going to be like. That's the comparison of what it looks like to talk about this. And when Moses went in to talk with God, what would happen is his face would shine, And he would put a veil over his face so that they wouldn't see the fact that, you know, you're having to look at someone with a a shiny face, but also the fact that, you know, it's, it's fading. It goes away. But if you think about that time of Moses and what that was like, there's fireworks. There's a parade. There is all kinds of excitement that goes on. If you look at Moses, he's got to be perhaps one of the most powerful men in all the earth that he could take a nation of slaves, two million people, bring them out across a desert in a place where there was nothing and bring them to a promised land. They go in and they capture that promised land. 
It describes how God comes down on Sinai and he descends on it in fire and rumbling and earthquake as they're able to get the command straight from the mouth of God, straight from the top of the mountain, and he's able to see all of this. Moses is the guy with the staff, remember? He can throw it down, it becomes a snake. He can pick it up by the tail and it turns back into a rod. How great is that? He's the one who turns water to blood and convinces Pharaoh after 10 plagues to let his people go only to be faced with the Red Sea. And he can take that rod and stretch it across and the Red Sea parts and two million people walk across on dry ground. He is the one who solved every single modern problem we have. There was no hunger for his nation. In fact, the food fell out of the sky. All they had to do was pick it up. He had solved world hunger. There were no people who were naked. Their clothes didn't wear out. It stayed right there with them. And so they didn't have any of those issues. There was no COVID. In fact, there was no disease among his nation whatsoever. It could be healed. It was gone. It was done. They didn't get sick. None of the diseases of the other nations around went in and were part of Israel. The government was amazing because God was their king. And Moses sat and he judged the people and God talked with him in the tent of meeting. And so therefore, he made a great nation, something that could never happen just on our own. And Moses is the face of that. Moses stood there before God. And Moses' face shone when he had been talking with God. You talk about glory. You talk about a time when something would be amazing. I mean, in every aspect, in every way you think about it, that was a time of glory. And Paul writes, that was nothing. What do you mean that was nothing? That is nothing compared to the glory of God that you're going to see now. What God does with his glory is so much more than that. If that was the ministry of death, now won't the ministry of the Spirit be even with more glory? We go, yeah. He'll heal all disease. He'll heal all our problems. He'll heal world hunger. He'll, you know, give us a nice house and a good place and we'll conquer all enemies and he'll, well, no. But he'll heal you on the inside. All those things you've been afraid of, all those things that have kept you from God, he will give you God's righteousness so how does the ministry of the Spirit have more glory? There's no tablets of stone. There's no mountains on fire. There's no smoke. But it is a permanent, non-fading glory of God where we become partakers of His divine nature and His glory fills us. We become people of love. We become people of grace. And maybe it doesn't show from the outside that all answers have been given and all things have been solved. But it's pretty amazing what God is able to do in the life of one sinner who repents and turns his life over to God. And so he concludes this third chapter saying, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. 
Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so Moses used a veil, it says, so people wouldn't see it fading. Aren't you glad? He says, we don't have to use that. People are able to see the glory of God that shines within us, not because it's put on the outside and we have to try and live up to it, but because it's put in us. He says, when they read the old law, they couldn't away, get away from just obedience and trying to be good. That's all it is. We obey and we try to be good and we do what we're supposed to and that's it. And they had no concept of the glory of God. But when you turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. You see the fulfillment of Christ. The Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is specifically that one Spirit of God who moved over the waters in creation. That one Spirit of God who filled Jesus as he was baptized, who came down upon those apostles. This is that one Spirit who then fills us as well. And there is freedom in that Spirit because it works by faith and not by rules. So we see this transformation that takes place from the Spirit, from one part of glory into another part of glory, not saying I'm going to move you to a bigger house with a bigger car and a nicer yard and a nicer this and a nicer that, but saying that I'm going to change you on the inside from where you have been feeling miserable and sorry for yourself into people who are people of glory who realize their forgiveness, who realize their grace from one degree of glory to another. And it's not just about going to heaven. It's about having glory within us. And it's about being in that place of glory with a God of glory. And what an amazing thing it is that God's able to do. And I just don't have words to explain it. I can see it in people, but I don't have the words to explain it. And even if I put their pictures up here, well, in fact, just look around you. You'll see some of them because they're here and they have glory in their life. So if you have a beautiful park, Again, not Arizona, right? How do you get it that way? How do you get that grass to grow like that, to be that green, to... Well, for me, I buy it that way. That's the only way it's ever going to look like that because it's all downhill from here. But here's what we've tried to do sometime in order to get that. Now, we understand what you have to do to get that. There has to be some water. There has to be some fertilizer because that thing is alive. And all you have to do is feed it, give it what it needs, and it shows glory like anything. It shows how perfect this grass can be and how great it looks and you mow it and it looks so wonderful and it smells so good and you can see all these things. But, you know, we've come up with a better way for people like me. Grass paint. <laughs> Have you seen this? I'm telling you, this could take Arizona by storm. Grass paint, lawn miracle. And this is what you do when nothing is growing and it's all dried up and it's not working, you paint it. And what you do is you have dead dry grass that looks great because after all, you went in and you painted it. Is that what you want? 
And sometimes this is how we're a Christian. Let me try and look good on the outside. Let me try and look all shiny and wonderful on the outside, and I'll try to live up to what it's supposed to be. You can tell the person who wants to worship, can't you? And you can tell whether or not you wanted to be here and whether or not you like singing the songs and you enjoy the communion and you're able to see the glory and the presence of God. And you can tell the people who just fidget because they can't wait to get out of here. And how long is he going to go anyway? <laughs> and you can tell the people who are excited to see you. Especially with kids, you can tell this. They come, and every once in a while, they're really excited to see you. And they come up, and they just give you the biggest hug, and it's the most wonderful thing. And you can also tell the ones who are, where their mom's going, go over and say thank you. They sent you a dollar in your birthday card. Now go over and say thank you. Thank you. Not the same, is it? And God says, let me give you this kind of glory, not the spray-on kind, but the kind that's real, the kind that is organic, the kind that grows, the kind that needs constant care, that needs constant grace from Jesus, the kind that has everything. I saw this from C.S. Lewis. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. Cannot happen. We need real Christianity, real people, people of glory. We're not trying to just sneak into heaven by one little inch we're already going to be people of glory who have developed that in our life here because of God's grace and because of the wonderful things that God gives to us. He empowers a life during a pandemic. We are not going back to normal. Please do not ever think that. No one who has been through a pandemic should come out the other side and say, glad we got through that. That better have built some faith and saying, this is what we do. When we are faced with impossible odds, and we are faced with life and death situations, this is what we do. We're gonna try and keep each other safe. We're gonna worship God. And I know for some of you, it's been very hard at home trying to do that. For some of you, it's easier. But we are going to worship God, and we have been through a whole year of this and more, and it has not left us the same. It has caused us to prove who we are. And that is what makes the difference. It's people who can find joy in crisis and find the glory of God in simple things. And it starts just from surrender to Jesus. In small ways, repentance from our sin and baptism into Christ and accepting his life and accepting our life in him and realizing that we are bound for glory. And he has shown us his glory. Let his glory be in us. And that's who we are as people of God. Boy, today, if you're not there, if you're just pretending and trying to get through it all, there is something so much bigger. Come, let us pray with you. Come, let us baptize you. Come, and let's figure out how to put the glory of God in your life. Let's all stand and sing together. <clears throat>